this is our concluding talk uh, and conversation for the uh, first studio alter ego at uh, Porsche Studios. And we've had, a, we've had an enthralling month of, of, uh, of talks which have generated incredible energy in the, in the studio and uh, discussions about the, the space of uh, Delhi, cities in India, etc. And uh, they've ranged from the environment, rivers, uh, geography, Paleolithic uh, geology, uh, to uh, song and uh, uh, literatures from a long time ago and now uh, more recent literature and art and so on and so forth. So it's been a it's been a wonderful spectrum of talk, and I think it's a it's great to have Ranjit here talking to us uh, uh, for the final session. Uh, I um, I was mentioning to him that uh, uh, I was. Uh, fortunate to be part of his session at the Kalagoda Festival, where he, along with a group of uh, notable uh, poets, uh, spoke about uh, the city and literature. And it was a, it was a, wonderful, uh, a, a wonderful session where they shared different imaginations of cities uh, with an audience of which I was a part. But my, uh, my, uh, my introduction to Ranjit was through a book of his, which I consider one, on my favorite list, which is a book called Confluence. And I think it's a book that's uh, extremely pertinent uh, to our times. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a book that talks about the crossovers between various, uh, well, various religions. That's the only word one can use. And uh, I think what 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 made me inadvertently buy that book was the opening. Uh, I think it's the preface, or where he talks about a football match, and he, you imagine it's a gladi gladiatorial uh, combat zone uh, uh, from a long time ago. Till you suddenly realize it's uh, uh, the UEFA Cup, perhaps every uh, every Sunday, uh, and you know uh, he says that when uh, the crowds of Christendom shout out Ola, Ola, Ola. They're invoking Allah from a very long time. And this, was the, this is the kind of imagination that I was, in, I was extremely excited by in that book, Ranjit. Uh, there have been many others. And uh, uh, of course, with your engagement uh, uh, in the, uh, as, an, uh, as one of the curators of the um, State of Architecture exhibition, uh, you have become much closer to us as architects, uh, if I may put it that way. Um, <laughs> may I please welcome you to uh, the Porsche conversation. We are really, really happy to have you this evening. Thank you so much, Riaz, it's, uh, and Shadipto and uh, everyone around this table. It's really a pleasure to, to be in this space of conversation. And thank you for your, for your warm and generous words of welcome. Uh, yes, Confluence is... Uh, it really was an expression of a long-term set of convictions that I've had about culture, as does Ilya Troyanov, who was my co-author for that book. Because we begin with, uh, for both for deeply personal and experiential reasons, and also because it's a political commitment, we begin with an understanding that cultures have never been pure, they've never proceeded from a single primordial source, and that they get made in the process of the coming together of very dissimilar uh, energies, be they religious, cultural, ideological, whatever it might be. And that in fact, it is a very dangerous thing to narrow down one's sense of what one's culture is or what one's religion is or what one's nation is. And I think as all of us, as architects, as poets, as cultural producers of various kinds, uh, we need to be cognizant of this because as is well known, we all know this. There is a particular worldwide tendency now to move to the opposite end, to be suspicious to the point of xenophobia of anything that is different, to want to narrow oneself into a little box of identity. So bringing these thoughts to, to our present uh, discussions, I have to say that uh, I'm going to probably start off uh, from one of the points to which uh, Ashokji took us yesterday. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of uh, his uh, reflections on Mir Taki Mir in the late 18th and early 19th century. And my protagonist today is uh, 
is someone who's received a great deal of bad press, is usually seen as having been an obese, debauched ruler who gave himself up to music and dance while the East India Company ran riot across his kingdom. And uh, I would like us to look at this person differently. I would like to see Wajid Alisha, Nawab Wajid Alisha of Aad, Avad, in a different light. And I'm, I'm going to devote my uh, presentation today, my discussion to, to his cultural contributions. Uh, also to think about how, as a patron of the arts, as a contributor to the arts, he remade a city within a city through the arts. He, as a patron, he transformed uh, the city through his artistic uh, endeavors. Because also we are, uh, maybe I should get my PPT going somehow. How do I do that? Um, hmm. Oopsie. Uh, sorry, Riaz, is there a way I can directly pull something from my screen to? Uh, there is a sc share screen button. Yes, uh, which I've, yeah. Yeah, I've clicked that. Yeah, so once you click that, it'll, it'll yeah. show you different windows that you can click from. Oh, lovely. Click the Perfect. PPT window, yes. Okay, I've done that. And you're gonna see my whole life <laughs> until you come to this. Yeah. Okay, are, are we all on the same page? Can you see the city and earth, et cetera? Yes, we can, Ranjit, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, so here's where I leap off. Uh, today, one of the great, um, if you will, questions facing all of us who are preoccupied with Indian architecture uh, is this uh, business of how our capital is going to be reimagined. I don't have to spell this out for anyone here. The Central Vista project seems to proceed from a sense that absolute patronage will come down from above. It will not involve uh, the participation of citizens. It will be highly symbolic without inviting uh, any popular participation. And it stems also from an ideology that has little use for bringing people together. By contrast, I want to think about how Wajid Ali Shah did absolutely the opposite. And thinking of his great architectural project, the building of this palace complex, the Kaiser Bagh, which many of you are probably familiar with in any case, uh, which took the better part of that decade, 1847 to 1856, and proceeded from a very different standpoint. It involved the blurring of the line between the sovereign and the people. It involved the, the experimental bringing together of uh, various religious imaginations. It involved the participation of the people in the sense that the architecture was not highly symbolic. It, if anything, it, it was, as I'll dwell on it a little more, uh, it involved a sequence of insides and outsides, demarcations and shared spaces, such that the palace somehow folded around the city and the city around the palace. And what got produced there through the medium of the festival or the performance was really uh, an ephemeral city, if you will. We're used to thinking about cities through built form. We're used to thinking of cities as, uh, as uh, static objects that we then somehow uh, animate through our activities. But what if we flip that around? And I suspect Wajid Alisha really did flip that around. How, how were pageants, festivals, gatherings, assemblies, the primary definition of the city in which the architecture then became stage, platform, backdrop, and so forth. And nonetheless, both elements were vitally important. So this is what I'm going to uh, look at today. Meanwhile, I will sketch out a portrait of this singular personage. So, as I was saying, this is the image that many of us have of Wajid Alisha. We really, I think to the extent that anybody thinks of him, uh, we see him through the prism of Satyajit Rai's admittedly brilliant film, Shatranj Ke Khiladi. But it's a film that projects uh, the ruler as an ineffectual puppet of the British, as someone who 
presides over the decline of Avad and who gets swept aside by the tide of history. And unfortunately, uh, also because we have a certain nationalist way of looking at these things now, nothing else that he did gets registered at all. It's all seen as foppery, as you know, effete nonsense, which really did nobody any good. Now I'm gonna try and argue that actually it was probably one of the last great projects of an Indian early modernity. Because we also have this idea that modernity proper begins with the colonial intervention. Now, even when we question this idea, it remains a default position. So I want to try and see if this, uh, the, his cultural projects actually spoke to some possibilities of a modernity that we achieved from within, from cultural resources that were brought together and synergized here. And this is what he, uh, another artistic representation of the man, but this is what, what he really uh, more or less looked like. So my, my premise here is that we need to look past the sort of self-loathing that became prominent after 1857, after the uprising and the collapse and the reprisal of the uprising. And in the 20 or 30 years after that, wherever you look in, within Indian culture, there is what we like to see as a modernizing or a reformist zeal. Whilst it achieves many good things in terms of introducing the more positive enlightenment values, what it does also is to try and wish away the 18th, the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. And uh, what it does really is to dismiss anything that happened in those, in those centuries as a sign of late feudalism. I'm thinking here, for instance, in Hindi literature, many of you will be familiar with this. Scholars like Mahavir Prasad Dwivedi and Ramchandra Shukla uh, set about writing the history of Hindi literature. But what they do is to dismiss the Ritikal the Avadhi and the Braj poetry of the Mughal and the Gangetic courts. It's all dismissed as Samantavad, feudalism, uh, as Patanon Muk, uh, decadent literature. Uh, there's also mapping onto that a certain leftist disdain for the feudal elites of 18th and 19th century India. So what we tend to do in the light of that kind of history writing is to throw out the cultural baby with the economic backwater. Uh, bath water. So, so I'm, I'm trying to now revisit all of this because we're going to be very soon at the bicentennial of Wajid, of Wajid Ali Shah's birth. I'm not quite sure how that's going to be celebrated, but I would like us to, to see what he did given the terrible constraints under which he worked. Now remember that when he came to power, uh, the, the East India Company effectively ruled India. Now, especially through William Dalrymple's wonderful book, Anarchy, we know that that we know this happened already in the 1760s. And after the Battle of Baksar in 1764, the company Bahadur took charge of the most profitable provinces of the Mughal Empire. And they ran a highly profitable protection racket. In Delhi, in Lucknow, in Calcutta, they installed uh, a British military force. They installed a resident. And their Indian hosts, the involuntary hosts, had to pay to keep, these, keep up these unwanted guests. What also, men, what also followed was rack renting, extractive uh, forms of revenue. Uh, and this is really the beginning of uh, colonial exploitation. So when Wajid Ali Shah came to the throne in 1847, uh, it was a very rich kingdom, but it was groaning under the exactions of the colonial yoke. So power, real power, was with the resident. The Nawab was left with the task of being responsible to the people in some way. It's a very, very difficult task. So what he did at first was to try and assert himself. Now, he was really a young man. He was in his 20s. Uh, this was not greatly liked by the resident. Uh, Wajid Ali Shah began by raising cavalry and infantry regiments. Now, this is not widely known because he's not seen as a military thinker. Of course, he gave his regiments very lyrical names, which didn't endear him to anybody. Uh, his regiments were called Banka, Dandi, Tircha, Ganagor, Akhtari, and so on. Uh, very lyrical names. This didn't go down well with anyone. So the resident was not amused. He put a stop to these projects. So the young Nawab was then asked to confine himself to what were seen as harmless romantic projects, leisure, the arts, which he did. 
but he was not a dilettante. He was an accomplished poet he wrote, who, who wrote under the pen name the Tahallus of Akhtar, sometimes Akhtar Pia. Like most members of that literary elite, the elite of his times, which was, let me remind all of us, was both Muslim and Hindu, and was three things, Muslim, Hindu, Jain, uh, sometimes Zoroastrian, sometimes there were English and French uh, officers or merchants who became part of this, this culture. So it was not a, it was not a simple, sort of uh, elite that one sees from the so-called Muslim socials of the 1950s. This was a multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, and multi-lingual uh, uh, elite. Uh, he was at home, like all these people, his, his contemporaries, in Persian, in Urdu, in Braj, and in Abadi. And in fact, when he was finally exiled by, by the British, he would record these travails of exile in a long poem called the Huzun i Akhtar, the sorrow of Akhtar. As a patron of the arts, he had supported many fine poets. His ustad was Mirza Raza Bark, uh, Mufti Munshi Amir Ahmed Amir, and also Ghalib, who got a stipend from, uh, from the Nawab. Uh, someone who's gonna be very important to my story today was his court poet and playwright, Agha Hassan Amanath, who wrote the first Urdu opera, which was called the Indar Sabha. Now, I know this seems like an incredible amount of detail, but I'm gonna flesh out some of the more pivotal details. What I want to really dwell on here is the manner in which uh, public devotion and fascination to the literary arts can actually shape a city and its culture. Today, this seems like an improbable ideal. In Lucknow, in the 1840s and 50s, uh, this was a reality. It was the public reality. So the Indar Sabha, uh, which drew on, uh, on uh, religious material that already was in place and secular uh, uh, stagings, this became the first Urdu opera and it had a resonance that would carry all the way into the early years of Hindi cinema. And Wajid Ali Shah was its patron. He acted in the performances of the Indar Sabha. And uh, Amanat's work was definitely inspired by Wajid Ali Shah's own aesthetic experiments. I'm going to offer us the first view of what the Kaiser vlog looked like. And some of the, all of these photographs that I'm going to show, such as this one, for instance, I'll go in order. Uh, as is evident, they're all photographs taken by uh, Western photographers who came in after the uprising had been crushed. So when we see it through that lens, we see it really as isolated from human activity, from cultural activity. And we might be tempted to see the Kaiser Bagh only through the prism of the picturesque, for instance, or we might see it as a folly. And I would suggest that we should imagine how these things would have looked like when they had music, dance, recitations, performances, textiles, uh, the, the flow of crowds on and off stage. Sometimes the audience was part of the staging. Uh, I would like us to imagine what otherwise looked like ruins or follies through the light of what I've just said. So I'm going to pull back now to something that Wajid Ali Shah wrote. He wrote a memoir called Ishq Nama, The Chronicle of Love. And this was written in 1850 while the uh, uh, Kaiser was still in process of being built. And he wrote there very candidly of his sexual experiences and his appetites, which the British resident thought of as, by the way, voluptuary. I'm going to dwell on that a little more. Also, the Nawab, like not a few of his contemporaries, was given to ecstatic transports into visionary states. Now, we can make of this what we will. They were very real psychological states to him. So one afternoon, he writes, he was sitting beneath a tree in one of his gardens when he tore off his clothes and stripped himself down to a loincloth. Inspired by the moment, he smeared himself and his female companions with vibhuti, with ash, and he became in that liminal moment a yogi. That heightened moment, imagine to yourselves this Nawab, a practicing Muslim, in this liminal threshold moment, sees himself as a yogi. And that heightened moment grew more unearthly as this whole assembly went down to the river and he says, evening falls like a hush and golden fireworks explode in the sky. Imagine this place in the night, fireworks exploding in the sky. 
The setting of this whole trance-like performance was the Kaiserberg, the emperor's garden, a complex and architectural fantasia that the Nawab had designed and constructed between 1847 and 1850 in Lucknow. It was meant to be a terrestrial vision of the paradise garden, a janatul firdos. This is a trope that recurs, as we all know, in Islamic architecture. It maps sometimes onto the Chaharbag, the Persian idea of the, the quaternary garden. And as in this case, it assumes a far more fluid uh, uh, articulation through a network of palaces, gardens, courtyards, pavilions. It embraced tombs that had pre-existed. It opened itself up to royal bazaars. So what we see here is both at a conceptual level, a setting for, if you will, a phantasmic, a fantastic religious and cultural imagination, but it's also a spatial reimagination. And it's deeply linked to something I mentioned in my opening remarks, which was the, I would say the devolution of sovereign power in these late Mughal decades in the last Mughal decades, effectively as they were to be, the devolution of sovereignty towards an emerging public of uh, merchants, you know, tradespeople, uh, entrepreneurs, diplomats, uh, a whole range of people who had their own will to exert. So in a way, what I'm talking about here is not just spatial reimagining, it also has to do with the breaking down of what had formerly been fairly tight divisions uh, in space that had kept classes apart. I think what we are seeing here, which is why I, I dedicate some of these reflections to the idea of an early modernity. It did not need necessarily the enlightenment values of English education through the British Raj to shake up the old feudalism. I suggest that already there was a public sphere here where the old power structures were opening up. They were becoming more fluid. There were many more interchanges between and among classes between the ruler and the ruled. Now, although the Kaiserbag was not technically a fortified citadel, its labyrinthine combination of enclosures and pathways made it an ideal fortress. So the end of the Kaiserbag really takes place during the Great Uprising, which of course the British described as a mutiny. It wasn't really a mutiny. Precisely for the reasons I've spelt out, it really brought the people of Lucknow together as the city's defenders, they were defending their way of life, their culture. <clears throat> so it was not Wajid Ali Shah who had already been uh, exiled to Metiaburs in Calcutta who defended the city. It was his wife, Begum Hazrat Mahal, who defended the city with its people. And uh, the Kaiserbag became the focus of the, of the uprising. And when the uprising was crushed, it was large parts of it were demolished along with mosques, temples, and large houses where the rebels had been sheltered. Eventually, wide streets would be driven through the, the complex and what had once been the courtyards of the Paradise Garden. And yet enough was left for these colonial photographers and engravers to imagine what it had been once. So let me, uh, rather than focus on what happened afterwards, the unhappy afterlife, I would focus rather on the happy years from 1847 to 1856, when the Kaiserberg was really a kaleidoscopic stage for this artistic flowering over which Wajid Ali Shah presided. And he was not only the ruler of Awadh, he was also Lucknow's chief patron. He was its impresario, he was its dramaturge, he was the aesthetician and he was its principal contributor. It's through the inn and through the Kaiserberg that he lavished his patronage on musicians, on dancers, on poets, on theater makers. And he encouraged them to think and to work across the lines of genre, across the lines of medium. And he moved away from the classical and the scriptural and towards the popular, towards the inclusive, towards the syncretic. And this again is something I'd like us to hold in mind because we tend to sometimes think that these uh, blurrings of genre and medium and so on are something that miraculously happen in that peculiar period that we used to call the postmodern. This is a century before the postmodern. And this is something that emerges as patronal desire. I'm also very interested in the desire of the patron 
Today's political patrons appear to have only the desire to create rhetorically empty symbols. I'm thinking of a patron who was fully involved in the making, the textures, the flavors, and the actual uh, poesis of every art. Now, Wajid Ali Shah, for instance, made the decision that the Pakhavaj should yield place to the tabla in his concert arrangements. Uh, this might seem like a small sort of uh, gesture to make, but it, it would actually have large resonances for music and it continues today. Uh, if, if today the Pakhavaj is virtually absent and the tabla is ubiquitous, that's because of Wajid Ali Shah because he also felt it was more versatile and that it could engage more dialogically with other instruments in concert. Even the idea of a modern Hindustani concert begins more or less in the Kaiserberg. Uh, also, the sonority of Drupad, which had previously been uh, preferred by Mughal and Rajput uh, patrons, that gave way to the Ghazal, the Thumri, the Kajri, the Tappa, all of these forms, which as many of you of course know, were identified primarily with uh, female musicians. So there had been a certain patriarchy in place where the sonorous drupad was identified with male musicians and these other forms were regarded as the domain of the female. Uh, Wajid Ali Shah actually gave his patronage and support to the so-called music of the female musicians. He enjoyed these forms. And he also wrote in them. He actually wrote Tumris and Tappas. As Akhtar Pia, he wrote Ghazals as well. Uh, it's a tragedy that after independence, after 1947, a strange neo-Puritanism of the Indian National Congress ensured that um, uh, uh, All India Radio would return to the old patriarchy. And it would create a classification of, or certainly support a classification of Classical and light classical, where many of these forms, Tumri, Tappa, Kajri, etc., are seen as light music. This is meaningless. And we have Wajid Ali uh, Shah to thank for the great flowering of these different forms. Now, he was trained as a musician. Now, he wasn't as a dilettante, as I pointed out. He was trained as a vocalist by Tansen's descendants, Pyar Khan, Basit Khan, and Jafar Khan. And he composed, as I said, also as Akhtar Pia, and he nurtured the dance form of Kathak. Now, some of the actors in his operas would have looked like this, the Lucknow courtesan uh, taken by an early Indian photographer, Daruga Abbas Ali. Uh, this is uh, the title page of Amanat's Indar Sabha, the text. And remember that these texts didn't fall from heaven. They weren't suddenly invented out of nothing. What we should prize Wajid Ali Shah for is also the way in which he, he synthesized existing and prior musical forms. Uh, this is the Indar Sabha choreographed very recently by the Kathak dancer Uma Sharma. And among the texts and the traditions that uh, the Nawab drew on were, for instance, the musical performances of the Nath Panthi yogis. Uh, as I say this, I'm aware of the incredible irony that the man who rules in Lucknow today is a Nath Panthi yogi, if you will allow that. But he is probably completely unaware of the fact that his predecessors in the lineage were also musicians. They were dancers, they were performers, they were, uh, they were uh, votaries of a, a song, of a, of, a, of a song play, if you will, called the Lavni. And this is Naveen Bilas's Lavni, published much, much later, but the image will give you some sense of how uh, the Kathas drawn from the epics and uh, episodes from, from uh, epic uh, narratives came into play here. Uh, the word, the name for the librettos for many of these, uh, uh, if you will, now we'd call them folk performances, but they were really the theater of the Gangetic Plain was Sangeet. And this is Puran Malka Sangeet. Uh, which you see. So Wajid Ali Shah was responsive, as I said, to these popular forms, to Lavni, to the Sangeet texts, to the Swang, which was, uh, which was men acting out the roles of the gopis. Uh, he was open to the Nortanki. And it's all of these forms that also fed into his patronage of, of Kathak, for instance. Now, Kathak, Birju Maharaj is, of course, well known to all of us. Birju Maharaj and his lineage wouldn't really have existed without the patronage of uh, 
this royal poet that we are speaking of this evening. Originally a version of temple dance, Kathak had been transformed gradually at the courts of Wajid Ali Shah's ancestors into a form marked by sensuous elegance and a certain Indo-Persian at grace. It spanned both the sacred and the secular. Wajid Ali Shah was also a trained dancer. His ustad in dance, his guru was Maharaj Thakur Prasad. And Wajid Ali Shah patronized the brothers Kalka Prasad and Bindadin uh, Maharaj. And these brothers would then found the Kathak dynasty that included Achan Maharaj, Lachu Maharaj, and Birju Maharaj. So once again, you see how the Nawab's operas and pageants and festivities both had an ephemeral public uh, articulation in his own time, but have also had long-term resonances and long-term results for, for uh, uh, Indian culture at large. And it's yet amazing that he's still not recognized as such a major contributor. And I now want, how am I doing for time? I am doing reasonably all right. Uh, I want to now dwell on a particular uh, artistic contribution of uh, Wajid Ali Shah's. And it's difficult now to speak of him only as a poet, only as a musician, only as a dancer, because for him, uh, in the spirit of the Vishnu Dharamotara Puran, Wajid Ali Shah did not recognize that these were specialized fields to be kept apart. Remember that he also designed and worked with architects on the Kaiserberg. So the architecture and theater and all of this was part of a much larger and cohesive project for him. So what he innovated in his Kaiserberg moment was a form called the Rahas. Now this word connotes a range of meanings as anyone who consults Platt's Dictionary of Urdu, Classical Hindi and English will know. Uh, yesterday, Ashokji was speaking so beautifully of how a city should have space for a number of different emotional possibilities. You could hide there, you could weep there, you could be exultant in a city, you can conceal yourself, you can reveal yourself. It's in that spirit, for instance, that now the Rahas, Wajid Ali Shah's Rahas, embraces a spectrum of affective, of emotional possibilities. That word Rahas means loneliness, it means solitude, it can mean a hiding place, it can mean mystery, it can also mean sexual activity and sexual pleasure, and it can mean plain merriment. So it embraces all of these things. It's also related to the idea of the Rahasya, the secret. And at the heart of a lot of Wajid Ali Shah's cultural activity was this idea that things that had formerly been Rahasyamaya, secret, kept within lineages and traditions, whether sacred or secular, whether artistic or scriptural, these would all somehow be released. So the essence of Wajid Ali Shah's cultural model of kingship, if we could call it that, was to allow people to participate fully with energy and dignity and their own agency in a secret that had been shared. And I find this a particularly attractive way of thinking about politics, that one does not keep a secret or a great mystery or a potentially liberating mystery to oneself as one's monopoly. One shares it, one allows for participation and contribution in it. So what was this Ras of Wajid Ali Shah's? It was a new form of ensemble performance, a choreography that drew together dancers, musicians, mimes, scenographers, and architects into a grandly synesthetic multimedia performance, an opera, where again, it was the terraces of the palace that would open up to the city. And it would be a mobile performance. Different parts of the performance would happen in different sectors of the Kaiserberg. As a child, the Nawab had been fascinated by the stories of Krishna and Vrindavan. He had been inspired by the circling dance of Krishna and the gopis, the Ras Leela. And thus the Rahas took its stories from that uh, Vaishnavite mythology. The first such production was staged when Wajid Ali Shah was still the heir apparent in 1843. And it was called Radha Kanaya, Radha Kanaya Ka Kissa. It featured a cast of, one has to bring in caste because caste is veined into these stories. It featured a cast of Brahmin actors from Mathura in the lead roles with, here's the surprise, the prince's favorite wives as the gopis. Now, it's amazing how 
such transgressiveness could take place in what otherwise seems to have been a feudal ethos. It's unthinkable today, for instance. When we think back from everything that has happened in the last 20 or 30 years, it seems incredible and improbable that such a staging could ever happen because so many rules are broken in this one sentence that I read to you. Uh, Brahmin male actors from Mathura playing uh, female roles. Uh, the prince's favorite wives playing gopis as well. A certain merging, a certain transgression of gender lines, gender roles, caste, class, religion. It's an incredible space of liminality that gets produced there. So there's justice to the claim that Wajid Ali Shah was the first playwright of the Hindustani theater. Because culturally and politically, this event, this Radha Kanaya Ka Kissa, was fraught with significance. I should also pause here and make another annotation to say that Wajid Ali Shah represents a confluence of multiple storytelling and multiple performative traditions. On the one hand, there's the entire Indo-Persianate legacy of the Kissa, the Masnavi, the Dastan, uh, which comes into his ambit. On the other hand, there's the Katha, the Nortanki, the Swang, uh, which comes in from another part of the same wide cultural spectrum which spans religions. And also these productions spanned different kinds of literary production. Scholars like uh, Francesca Orsini, for instance, uh, and Francis Pritchett have described the people of this time, particularly in North India, as being oral literate. Now, when we use our understanding of literacy or education, we tend to describe only lettered people as literate. We think of people who can't read as being somehow illiterate. But these were people who had a certain oral literacy, people who were living archives. Uh, I've personally witnessed this in a totally different context in Tukaram's cave on a mountaintop in Lehu, near Pune, where uh, I've met Varkaris who are living archives, the living archives of the Abhangs of Tukaram. They just start them off with a line and they'll just recite uh, any Abhang that you might want them to sing. So Wajid Ali Shah was also drawing upon these forms of collective memory, these forms of memory that are literally embodied, that might not be printed, but that are in people's minds. And at the same time, he was part of a larger circulation where there were people who came from oral culture, there were people who worked from manuscripts, scribal culture, and there was early printing already in place. So it's a very, very rich literary and publishing culture of which he is a part. And uh, Rosie Jones, who's the author of, a, of a, an influential biography of Wajid Ali Shah, has this to say about uh, Wajid Ali Shah's uh, uh, writing. This was an, I quote, this was an important moment in the history of Indian theater. For the first time, a Muslim monarch was directing a play about Lord Krishna and his amorous affairs, an event which could please, which could only please his many Hindu subjects, end of quote. At Kaiserbagh, the Nawab built a baradari, a pavilion with 12 doors, not very different in tone and look from this one, uh, which was neither indoor nor outdoor. It was a platform for dance, theater, poetry, for conversation. It could be used at different times of day, in different seasons. And this is where many Rahas productions were staged. And of course, he, himself appeared in many of these as Krishna, as Indra. And once a year, the Nawab would costume himself as a yogi. Remember that story I told you from his Ishknama about how he saw himself suddenly as a yogi. He would wear saffron robes. He would cover his face and body with vibhuti, with ash. Also with pearl necklaces and a japmala in his hand. And during this spectacular public event, which was called the Jogya Jashan, he invited all of Lucknow's citizens, regardless of religion, caste, or class, to dress up as yogis and yoginis, and to participate in a pageant that blurred all of these lines, blurred the line between royal court and public space, between stylized art and everyday life. And the Nawab came across on these occasions, but it was a significant public image to portray. He came across as someone who was bhogi and yogi in the same moment. He was a voluptuary. He was also an ascetic. And this is not as contradictory as it might seem, because the further back we go into the literature of the Tantras, which also is now seen with great suspicion, 
we find that the ideal for conduct is, uh, is an interplay between these. It is only, I suspect, I more than suspect, I know this to be true, a very, very peculiar neo-Puritanism that we've imbibed from Victorian morality that prevents us from taking this back as our own heritage. Uh, Wajid Ali Shah was certainly drawing on the, this, these deep tantric strata of culture in the Gangetic North, but he was also drawing on a Mughal tradition of bodied aesthetics, which is referred to as zork in the writings on this subject. Zaika, taste, zork, a person of taste. And people who shared in this were not voluptuaries. They were not merely aesthetes. They were also people who were aware of what spices to eat in which season, what kinds of fabrics to wear in which season, what was appropriate to time, place, occasion, uh, how to care for oneself in times of good health and in times of contagion. So the Ahle Zork, the people of taste, were what Catherine Schofield marvelously called Mughal Rasikas. And their being Rasikas was not confined only to their taste in the visual arts or literature or music. It encompassed all of their experience and their engagement with the seasons, with the weather, with the ecology, with fruits and vegetables that were available, with forms of medicine. So we are looking really at a holistic understanding of life, which you might want to call aesthetic, uh, but it's unfortunate that today we see aesthetics as a far more narrow field. Uh, clearly, to people like Wajid Ali Shah and his contemporaries, it really embraced all of human experience. I also want to dwell on why Wajid Ali Shah has not really been given the credit he deserves, because as far as I can see, uh, he prefigured somebody like Wagner in Central Europe as a cultural uh, practitioner, as an artist. Now, if Wajid Ali Shah had not been Indian, if he'd not been on the wrong side of colonialism, if he hadn't been overthrown, if he'd written in a European language, we would, when I say we, I don't mean we here, but a West dominated Eurocentric way of history writing would have taken him far more seriously because really everything that he did through the Rahas, through these productions of his, these synesthetic multimedia productions, he anticipated what Diaghilev and the Ballet Rus would have were going to do six decades after Wajid Ali Shah. Uh, he also anticipated uh, what Wagner was doing. Remember that Wagner and Wajid Ali Shah were actually contemporaries. Wagner lived from 1813 to 1883. Wajid Ali Shah lived from 1822 to 1887. They were exact contemporaries through the 19th century. And yet we all know what Wagner did and have great admiration and know his work in detail. Now, Wagner wrote an essay called The Artwork of the Future that was published in 1849. Uh, and it's a path-breaking essay where Wagner announces what he calls the Gesamtkunstwerk, which is often translated as a total artwork. But as those of us who know the etymology would, would, would agree, Gesamtkunstwerk really means much more a a work brought together, a work collected together. It suggests the collectivity and the bringing together of, of the arts. And uh, for Wagner, uh, an ideal he never quite achieved, but the ideal for him was a symphonic manifestation of expanded theater. That essay was published in German, in Central Europe in 1849. In that same year, Wajid Ali Shah was midway through building the Kaiserdorf. I put it to you that the Nawab's Rahas was really a Gesamtkunstwerk. And it was achieved because uh, unlike Wagner, Wajid Ali Shah didn't need to worry about patronage. I mean, he was his own patron. It was achieved on a scale of lavish sumptuousness, of subtlety, of aesthetic integrity, and with an immensely important political vitality. It was achieved in ways that Wagner could only have dreamt of, but could never actually have executed. And I would therefore argue that the Nawab foresaw, anticipated the Aguilev. He certainly achieved what Wagner had done without the two men ever have known, probably never knowing each other's work. Remember that the Nawab wouldn't even have been taken seriously in Europe at that time as a cultural producer. 
But I think that he also became the progenitor of the Hindustani theater and what came to be known as the Parsi theater, and eventually an ancestor or grandfather, if you will, of popular Indian cinema. There's really a genealogy that links the Khazar Bagh through the Parsi Natak, through uh, Hindustani theater, all the way to the early, uh, to, to Falke, to Madan, and to many of the pioneers of Indian cinema. And of course, we know what happens in the end. So I'm going to, this by the way is uh, the Lanka Pavilion as Theron refers to it in the title of his engraving. But actually the entire complex of uh, Kezerba was described by Lucknow's people as Lanka. They saw it as this incredible mythic place, probably seeing it less as Ravan's capital and more as Kubair's capital, which it had once been, the place of magic, the place of possibility. And this is how it ends in 1858. The Nawab, of course, had uh, advanced a vast amount of money to the East India Company. But instead of returning it, what they did was to charge him with incompetence and overthrow him. He was overthrown in February of 1856. He barely spent nine years on the throne. He was taken away. He met his fate with dignity. He sailed down the Ganga. He went to Calcutta. He was given an estate called Metiabur's, which he tried to turn into what Lucknow had once been. And this experiment uh, met with mixed success. Rudrangshu Mukherjee, the historian, speaks of what happened to Avad after he left. I quote Mukherjee here. It appeared that on the departure of Jane Alam, the life of the people, the life has gone out of the body and the body of this town has been left lifeless. In fact, in contemporary accounts of the departure of Wajid Ali Shah, you see very, very clearly other epic resonances. There's clearly a literary and a felt bodied affective understanding among the people of Avad that what happened here was of the same emotional resonance as a story we all know from the epics when another hero departs Ayodhya and goes into exile. So at every phase and stage of Wajid Ali Shah's story and his activities and his cultural understanding, you see how models and templates and episodes from different religious traditions come together, you know, without contradiction. They get held together in a space of what, as Riyaz said earlier, I like to think of as confluence. The epilogue to this story is that barely a year after the Nawab had been deposed, we all know the story a population that had been ground to the, to the earth by colonial exaction, by the greed of the East India Company, finally rose up. So whether they were peasants or nobles, soldiers, scribes, merchants, whoever they were, they came together in the great uprising, in the Ghadar. Uh, in 1857, Barakpur, Calcutta, Mangal Pandey fires what becomes the first shot of this, unfortunately, ultimately ill-starred enterprise. But I want to hold on to a moment within it. In, in May of 1857, on 30th May, the rebels entered Lucknow and they penned the British into the residency. And then they, what they do is that Begum Hazrat Mahal becomes the regent and Wajid Ali Shah's infant son, uh, Burgess Kadr, becomes the new king. With hindsight, we all know that these events were going to be very, very temporary. But something amazing happens there. As the sepoys set this infant on the throne, and remember that the so-called Bengal army had largely been conscripted from, from Abad. These were men who had known the Rahas. They had memories of the Jogia Jashan. They knew these texts, these stories, these performances was, had circulated across Abad. So they hugged the little boy, the prince. And what they said to him was, you are our Kanaya. You are our little Krishna. And as I say this to you, I am truly overcome by great emotion. Not out of nostalgia for a time we've lost, but out of sorrow for a time that we are about to lose. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you. It's going to take a while to be able to uh, <laughs> to ask you a question, so to say. But perhaps uh, I might ask you to talk a little bit more about uh, Ilgam Hazrat Mahal and uh, uh, her relationship with. Uh, uh, incredibly enigmatic husband. <laughs> Where does one begin? Now, again, she is somebody who we could see as a proto-feminist heroine, if you will. Because we tend to, again, for reasons that I don't have to spell out, it's really Rani Lakshmi Bai of Jhansi who gets um, prime billing as a great female leader of the uprising. And indeed she was, this is not to take that away from her in any way. But I don't think we look sufficiently at, uh, at Begum Hazrat Mel, who was by turns a diplomat, a military commander, uh, someone who fully understood uh, the transition that was taking place around her. And uh, it's, it, it's really, I think, a you know, the, these figures have been buried under myth. They've been buried under, as I said earlier, bad press. They've been marginalized. But I think from what we, what we know or can conjecture, uh, she's someone who both participated in these, in, in, in these cultural extravagances as they were seen of her husband, but also saw the shadow of history coming and prepared for it. So even while I'm spending all this time talking about Wajid Ali Shah as a cultural contributor, I would also see the happenings around him in the light of a system that was going to collapse. So he was in one sense, he was its last spasm. She was someone who saw that it needed to be uh, secured against what was, what was to come. Like many, many people in Gangetic India at the time, I think she had read the writing of the wall. But I think what's important uh, from our point of view is that she chose to stay on, she chose to resist. Does that answer your question, Riaz? Yes, there are yes, many yes. different strands to be recovered from this, from this narrative. I mean, I've chosen to highlight Wajid Ali Shah, but uh, Begum Mazrat Mahal would be a figure to whom one should devote equal attention. Whilst on this story, by the way, since we're talking about, uh, so to speak, the, the key royal persona of that period, uh, we don't think, for instance, of Gangadhar Rao either, who was the Raja of Jhansi, not that he ever really had that title, uh, who no one ever hears of. Now, he was a patron of the Swang, he was a patron of Nortanki, he was a patron of some of these theatrical uh, performances too. And the court of Jhansi was well known while he was yet alive for, uh, for, for its patronage of, of these arts. So in each case, I think there's, sorry. No, please yeah. go on. Please go on. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's, it's these, this material, this period can be looked at through various prisms, through uh, straight out cultural history as I've done, uh, or a military history or a history of diplomacy, uh, but I think we would all benefit from bringing these different histories together so that we don't simply become nostalgists or we, simply do, we don't simply take a pragmatic view of what happened at the time. I think we need to leaven each perspective with the other. And as I said, the reason that I dwell on Wajid Ali Shah is not because I'm a nostalgist. I'm of course fully aware of his weaknesses, the weakness of that feudal system that was already being uh, uh, transformed into, into a colonial order. But there are cultural reserves of form there. There are reserves of affect. There are reserves of mutual understanding of the possibility of synthesis, which we would today do well to, to recall and remember. So for me, it's, it's, it's part of our struggle against forgetting. Again, as Ashokji said yesterday, one of the things we need to do, what does poetry do? Right? It, it is a battle against amnesia, against forgetting. It's a bearing of witness. And it's a commitment to dream of that which is not yet. So it's in that spirit that I'm, I'm thinking of these times from the 19th century. 
Thank you, Ranjit. I'll open it up to the other panelists and whoever would like to join the conversation can please switch on their videos. Everyone Professor as a panelist, uh, Riaz, it's a meeting board. So. Yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> but it's what of habit. Sorry, Vicky. Yeah, uh, Ranjit, thank you very much for this absolutely astoundingly um, opening up lecture. Uh, you you so brought a lot of things together which are of great importance, both to the studio but also in general. It set me thinking, and mine is not really a question, but you might want to say something about it. Um, for example, slightly earlier than Wajid Ali Shah, there would be people like Sarfoji in Tanjore. Absolutely. Yes. And there must have been a number of these uh, hugely enterprising uh, cultural, political, economic minds at Absolutely. work throughout the, throughout the land. And it's, it's very interesting if somebody now begins to put that all together as, as say, a uh, hundred years of of uh, taking new forms of language and thought, new forms of art, integrating them and bringing across the land all these things. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So, now, my question is slightly mischievous in that regard. Sure. <laughs> and I hope you'll pardon me for that. I wonder whether somebody like Anadurai in Tamil Nadu would be doing something similar, not as explicitly as Vajid Alisha, okay. but bringing a cultural, a language con content, uh, a film content, a popular content, so that then we can see MGR and Jayalalitha in a slightly different light. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your observations and your question. Uh, I completely agree with you. As I said, I think there is a genealogy that links Wajid Ali Shah through the Hindustani and the Parsi theater to not only Hindi cinema, but to Indian cinema at large in, in its various languages. I think at various phases, Indian cinema has really been able to draw on these prior models and the values that go with them. Uh, but I'll, I'd also really like to respond to your wonderful observations. Bec and I'll start by saying that what constrains, constrains us in recovering our own history of South Asia from the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, what constrains us is the far more recent prisms that we've given ourselves. You know, today we look back and we seem to think that how we define ourselves today is how we've always defined ourselves. So we have the sad idea that linguistic states define how languages have worked in India. Or we have the idea that because we're seeing our religions today on the far side of 19th and 20th century fundamentalism, that they've always been like that. Or we think that our regions are what they look like on the map today, but it's completely untrue. I mean, for instance, you mentioned Sarfoji. The fact is that the great centers of Marathi culture for several, for about 150 years, they were not in what is Maharashtra today. They were in Tanjavur, which you mentioned. They were in Indore, which is in central India. And there, as well as in what is Maharashtra today, uh, they were part of, I mean, these were multilingual and multi-ethnic and multi-religious courts. So the kinds of ideologies that are dominant today would fall down and faint if they really had to look at what India looked like, say, in 1526 or 1650. And I've had this experience also with, while teaching on confidential subjects, you know, when you try and remind people that the Prem Akhyan is not a Hindu text, it's a Sufi romance written by the Shattari Sufis. They're called Prem Akhyans. If you look at the names of the protagonists, they all look like Hindu names, but these are Sufi romances. Uh, Shivaji had a Braj court poet, Bhushan, who writes a paean of praise to Chhatrapati Shivaji uh, in Braj. It's called the uh, Shiva Bhushan. So whichever way you look, take the spread of Braj. I mean, it spreads far and wide. It's spoken and written and responded to in Golconda, in Pune, in Bijapur, far away from the Braj Bhumi. 
the broad heartland. So honestly, you know, I mean, you mentioned Sarfoji. There were many such regional courts and regional rulers who were fully actively part of this trans-regional network across languages again. Uh, as early as Akbar's court, I mean, it's kind of lengthy answer to what you said, but I'm just offering a series of examples to just talk about how our misunderstandings today, the kinds of ideological narrowness that we've been subjected to prevents us from seeing that, for instance, the court of Akbar, of Jahangir, uh, these were also places where grand translation projects took place. The Mahabharat was translated, the Ramayana was translated, the Yogvasish, the Panchatantra, multiple times, not just once, into Farsi. Uh, it's also where people worked across languages. People who knew Farsi learned Sanskrit. People who knew Latin, Jesuits, came here and studied Farsi. They worked together in this crucible of culture. So this, these are histories we need to recover today. And thank you for, thank you for asking that question because it, it, it really reminds us of how much there is a value that we need to reclaim today. Hi, Ranjit. Prem, hi, how are you? Yeah. Good, good. Uh, let me make a comment which you can perhaps respond to. But when you were describing Kaiserbad, I thought that on one hand there's the physical structure of a palace and that physical structure is designed to host certain art forms. But probably to Wajid Ali Shah, the language, the, the, the universe of uh, beauty and divinity those art forms portrayed was as real as the physical structures of the palace. Absolutely. And, and that drove me to go to my bookshelf while you were talking and pull out Joseph Rickworth's book, The Idea of a Town, where he looks at a, in Etruscan and Roman towns. Yes. And uh, he makes an interesting point over there. He says that uh, it's only in our modern world of rationality we say a thing just means itself. One word has one meaning. But in the cities of antiquity, the fact that something could mean both itself and something else at the same time was so common it was taken for granted. Absolutely. And and when, when he's trying to uncover this these connection between multiple realities in the in the towns he's looking at he says he is uh, forced to rely on associations established by assonance alliteration illusion and and he goes on to suggest he doesn't explicitly say this i'm reading this into what he's saying that in the language we deploy to talk to plan our cities today the language of poetry and dreams would be far more powerful and effective a language than the language of rationality we believe must be exclusive. I think that's absolutely true. Thank you for bringing this to the table. It's, it's absolutely marvelous. Yeah. Because rather than fantasy or dream or epiphany being uh, some kind of optional extra, it's built into the texture of, of a place like a Kaiserberg. Which is why I think early on I said that when you see it through the frame of colonial photography, it looks like a folly. Because this is the kind for, of building which in one strain would turn into a so-called so Moorish Orientalism, uh, which became popular, as you well know, of course, at a certain point in Europe, also traveled across the Atlantic. Uh, people trying to recreate maybe the Alhambra in a European metropolis. And... Uh, it's a pity that, I mean, it would be a pity if we looked at the Kaiserberg and only saw it as some kind of folly. But what you've said is, is really precious for that reason, to see how its fabric was also made of dream. It was also made of epiphany. It was meant to have these multiple apertures to a larger imaginative world and to, frankly, to spiritual experience. But how do, we, how do we recover that for our present pedagogy about planning cities? I mean, exactly this is my question to you. And it is not only to you. My name is Vasavra. <clears throat> I'm calling from Ahmedabad. Indeed. Uh, 
you know, because this richness, for example, Satyajit Rai tried to recreate this entire imagination. And I think if you, if you look at his movie, which one would look over and over again, you know, he tried his level best to bring this imagination to the reality. If as architects or students of architecture, if you want to really work on this, how would one go about is the question. And this is a question which is in our domain. I'm not asking you that as a question. But uh, supposing we want to have some more information and collaboration with scholars like you in order to out Klein, you know, the entire, the entire theater as it was, you know, through references. How do you think one should go about? I mean, is there sufficient amount of uh, literature available <clears throat> which one can really compile? You know, I would, I would not uh, mind volunteering for this, you see. But with the kind of research that you have done, at least I haven't done so far. You know, I have read quite a bit about Vajid Ali. You know, even if, when I was looking at Satyajit Rai's movie in, in 70s. But beyond that, you see, the kind of, you know, material that you have collected out of your own interest. Could you, could you sort of share this in, in terms of in terms of material, you know, which one can really use to get into this idea of how one would think today about Kaiserbag, you know, based sure. on the kind of, uh, based on the kind of uh, evidences, you know, which are there. You know, because this also is, you know, this kind of conjectural reconstruction is also an area, you know, in which I am very much interested. Right. And I do this kind of conjectural deconstructions of, of monuments, you see, wherever I work. And I sort of try to sort of imagine a temple out of its debris. Or if I try to, if I'm working on a step well, I try to imagine its full form, you know, even through modeling. So my interest, whenever I have seen this, you see, uh, ruins. You know, the urge is to somehow see how one can really reconstruct this as conjecture, you know. Because I think in that sense, then that becomes a purely an architectural imaginative exercise, you know, which actually corresponds, you know, with the kind of literature and the information that is available with people like you. So I would certainly like to somehow work on this and would seek your help. Well, I'm, I have to thank you so much for your, for your <laughs> question and your observations. But I have to say that I'm the beneficiary of an immense amount of scholarship that is in process. And uh, it's really in the last 10 or 15 years that uh, there's been so much work done on these centuries. Uh, a little before to Catherine Hansen's work, for instance, on what's broadly called the Norton Key tradition. But it really looks at the different kinds of literary and performative and uh, oral culture traditions of Northern India, which then feed into uh, everything that I just spoke about. Uh, David Lunn, who is, as I speak, translating the Braj poetry of Shah Alam II. Uh, Catherine Schofield, who is doing pioneering work on Mughal music. Uh, and uh, Francesca Orsini, who I refer to, is also looking at the the history of the book in Northern India through the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, and a number of other uh, scholars in this, in this field. I can name so many of them. And we're fortunate that this is in process because what it really speaks to is a, a challenge, really, that we need to immerse ourselves in the sensibility that produced this architecture and produced it as an integral part of this larger, more holistic worldview. Because I think sometimes, not that I want to blame any friends or colleagues, but when we think about holistic visions or cosmic visions, we tend to arc back thousands of years. And uh, I mean, great things have come out of that as well. 
when we think back to cosmic notions, let us say, of the mandala. But we tend to forget that uh, these cosmic imaginations, this way of modeling a city to a kind of cosmic image, and how that was to be detailed at every level of experience in, in a city, that there was, there, there, was, there was expertise for that, honestly, right up to the 1850s. And it's often in languages that many of us in the humanities in India do not study anymore. So every name that I mentioned, you would have seen these are scholars who are based elsewhere. They're Western scholars, <clears throat> but they do the hard work of studying Braj, Avati, Farsi, Sanskrit, and they're able to read the sources and present them, Urdu, uh, any number of these languages. Whilst too many of us work from either secondary sources or are not familiar with the sources at all. So I think artisanal and uh, very brass tacks as it sounds, I think the first step is really to put a bibliography together. Exactly. And then exactly. to engage with some of these scholars in a space of dialogue. And I think mm -hmm. architects and some of these scholars in the humanities were to come together. Sure. Your totally be fulfilled. No, this is, this is, you see, there is another angle also. You see, I, I belong to a city. And those Nawabs had direct links with Lucknow because the queens were from Lucknow. I belong to Junagadh. Yes. And uh, currently a very close friend, you know, who was actually a collector many years ago in Junagadh, but a student of history and from Lucknow. So he has always been pressing me, you know, to somehow devote some more time after Junagadh on Lucknow. <laughs> So I, and he's currently, he's in a position where he can also help, you know, and he also has been talking about Kesarbag, you know, as something, you know, which he would like to somehow conserve, you know. Yes. In the, in this, in this entire milieu of some kind of, you know, fanatism that is going on, you know, because he thinks that the Lucknow will be lost. Yeah. So exactly. I can sort of uh, maybe, you know, I can contact you later and Please maybe say. take your advice. Yeah. I'm very happy to contribute to the project. Please. Because bibliography will be something, you know, which would be very good. Right. Beginning. No, thank huh? you so much. This was really eye-opening and fantastic for me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sanjit, uh, may I uh, take you back to that question about the design of cities? With, uh, yes. This Spirit of uh, Vajid Ali, let's uh, let's call it that. For okay. uh, and I'm and I was thinking that uh, what was uh, what was uh, vivid in your description was the you know this uh, I don't know uh, you mentioned the the particular term used for the ritual where he would come out as a yogi and invite the entire citizenry to be part uh, to be yogis and yoginis as well. Uh, and I imagine that there is this kind. I mean, there is this. Uh, behavior that starts from uh, a, a personality, which then is uh, expanded, magnified uh, through certain uh, public rituals, which have, uh, of course, because he's a he's the monarch, or he's uh, he can do this at that scale. Uh, but I'm, I mean, and and one one imagines this uh, uh, personality and his behavior pouring into the city in in that sense and and kind of uh, that imagination being shared with a larger uh, a larger public uh, and i'm i'm wondering whether uh, this whether the clue lies in the way that we behave in cities in the way that when when we reclaim uh, what we do imagine if what we are doing right now uh, is somehow in uh, city space. I don't know. I, I just wanted to know whether behavior and uh, the way that we gather and what we talk about in public space, uh, the way that we actually uh, construct narratives of uh, uh, of of pleasure vis-a-vis -vis our behavior. Right now, the the I was just thinking about it in a kind of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, uh, plan of how I schedule the day. And I was thinking, if you can't do it in, in, in your own day, if there's no poetry or there's none of this imagination in the behavior that is going to make up my day, I don't see how we are going to think about it vis-a-vis, -vis, say, the city or even a, a, a slightly larger community, etc. 
So I just, I just thought that I, this is what was going through my mind when, when we were talking about reclaiming and whether yes. that, uh, that starts with a change in personal behavior as uh, Mr. Gandhi would perhaps uh, <laughs> try to do. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thank, you for, thank you for this because it's, it's absolutely true. And I've occasionally felt it at various moments during the lockdown where, you know, when you've had to go out for something and you suddenly begin to see constraint and then little moments of possibility open up in public space. And then you think of all the times that you never actually use public space for things that could have been done. So you're absolutely right. I don't, I don't have an immediate uh, uh, clear response, but I have several uh, kinds of ways of approaching what you've wonderfully shared. One would be that maybe we could think of other ways than being the flaneur, because um, thanks to a certain genealogy of Baudelaire via Benjamin, uh, we are always talking about flannery and uh, that comes out of a certain understanding of a, a very particular history. We tend to take what comes, not that I'm a nativist, don't get me wrong, but um, it sometimes seems to me that we take on trust as universal things that emerge from rather particular histories. I mean, the flannery wouldn't exist without Hausmann, uh, without what happens after the uprisings in Paris. Uh, Hausmann simply demolishes the old shanties and tenements, wide avenues are created, uh, no little streets where students can set up barricades, no cobblestones large enough to be weapon grade, uh, crowd control is easy, so we, we all know this, those great axial sight lines are also about crowd control. Uh, and the flaneur, therefore, is, a, is someone who resists that, who discovers the world of the arcades and the department stores, and it's a new underground as an anti-city to Hausmann City. What might that be for us? I think we need to think that through. Uh, think also of how we are, many of us, just by, just by virtue of who we are, by class, upbringing, training, pedagogy, whatever it is, we are maybe unable to participate in some of these larger festivities. That said, the festivals themselves are not what they might have been in the 19th century. They too have been commodified in a certain way. So I've, I've talked myself to a point where I'm gonna say we need new festivals, <laughs> but I mean, mad as that sounds, I, I think, you know, I, I, I would completely agree with you. I think there are new forms of being together in public space that we need to think through uh, or feel through, maybe. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of different kinds of monopolies that claim these things. Festivals usually have some sort of religious monopoly that's active. Neighborhoods tend to be controlled by certain social assumptions. Uh, how do we reclaim the parade, the pageant, the festival, the procession? There are so many forms that are available to us from ambient or prior culture, but how do we reinterpret and tweak them? Uh, Ranjit, I, I'd suggest we have a, a local uh, equivalent to the flanier, uh, especially if you look at the flanier as associated with idleness, in the sense of yes. flanier is someone who can detach himself from purpose and just wander uh, through the city, looking at the city for its own sake. And uh, we have the, an equivalent in this notion of idleness, which is a gathering space, which has its roots in the village, but is also found in uh, cities, which is uh, a platform around a tree. And uh, the Kannada word for this platform is uh, wonderful. It's called Somberi Kate, which means a platform for loafers, for <laughs> idle yes. people. And, and, it, and it's talking about also a certain kind of idleness, except whereas the flanier is solitary and the somberi kate, you, you step away from the city and just pause to engage with a fellow citizen. That, that's fantastic. I know Pushpamala ran a, a periodic meeting in, mm -hmm. uh, in Bangalore called somberi kate. It was meant to offer the space of leisure, repose, uh, creative, non-purposive activity somehow. I think that's absolutely marvelous. I mean, or, or the Adda, for instance, comes to mind. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, also, people who are devoted to Banaras talk about how, I don't know how true that is, but apparently it is part of traditional Banarasi culture to have this space and time in the day to be at large without, without an agenda, without needing to go anywhere, to just have a larger experience of self and city. But, but precisely things like the Sombari Kate, I think we need to reclaim those kinds of spaces, those kinds of moments. I think also this is a, a time for the Flanur to give uh, way to the Flanus, who is a female Flanur. Indeed, and that too. Not, uh, the, we have not permitted uh, Flannery of, uh, of the ladies yet. Uh, in the same sense that Paris did when the department of stores came up. But I think that uh, that is what we really need to focus on because the men have had their turn, it seems. But Anjit, uh, thank you so much. Uh, your talk has actually left us with a sense of nostalgia, of a certain loss of a certain way of life and a celebration of nuance actually in our lives. Uh, sort of mirrors the kind of a heaviness of heart uh, because some of us feel that because this is the last uh, talk in a set of talks uh, which have kind of shown us uh, nuance and beauty of nuance uh, over the last couple of weeks. So I, I just want to kind of extend uh, what Riaz was talking about uh, in terms of the theatricality of, uh, of life. And um, so the notion of, um, I, I just want to make a distinction between the notion of theater as an outpouring of the everyday, um, where, you know, Kaiserbag becomes a space that enshrines uh, that outpouring. Uh, we, we, the British, who were also kind of went about their own way with a theatrical, theatricality uh, and a show of their own, but um, the city as a, as a form, or rather the city form as uh, Maison Sen, uh, seems to always favor a violent theat theatricality uh, post a certain time, yeah. uh, rather than an outpouring of uh, life in, in that sense. And um, Yes, in, in some ways, the, you know, the rediscovering of uh, everyday rituals, the new ways of social uh, community kind of coming together are, I think, one of the ways. What are the other ways that uh, you feel that uh, the, the everyday can be celebrated in terms of this? That's really, um, I mean, it takes these reflections to, to the next phase, I think, where we really have to, to, to address these questions in terms of the dreaming of the not yet. But as you were speaking, uh, I, I just thought of how many of us live, grow up in cities that still had that mise-en-scene of violence and authority that you spoke of. It, uh, I mean, much as I, like anybody else, would celebrate good old colonial South Bombay, very aware of what the Maidans really are. The Maidans were, an, were esplanades. They were, again, they were a crowd control device so that people couldn't assemble against the fort and it gave the people inside the fort um, clear sight lines for cannon fire should anyone attempt to approach the fort. So again, we are, how do we reinscribe the Maidan then? Would be a very particular kind of response from the architecture and the public space of my own city. These are the questions I would ask. I mean, we have symbolic centers that are no longer symbolic centers. Can they be gatherings for something else? The notion of the Axial Avenue, the town square, the great monument. How do we reclaim all of this in ephemeral or liminal ways? Now, the Jogia Jashin, again, it happened once a year. But the effect of it was to provide a very different image of authority. It was to speak of a different kind of public participation. Uh, how do we retrieve that in our cities? Because I too often find that when we do have cultural festivals, for instance, they tend to replicate some of these uh, mechanisms of access and uh, who can be admitted, who can't, who belongs, who doesn't. Uh, I'm not saying this is true of absolutely every cultural festival, but it does tend to happen. So how do we, how do, we do this? Because everything that we do in, in thinking through the use of public space actually brings us back to our great social and political asymmetries. So these are ultimately also political questions. So 
you know, whenever when we're in the humanities or in architecture, every now and again, we meet colleagues who will say, oh, please don't politicize these questions. These questions are already, already political questions. So when we say, how do we, as you said, bringing in the flan news, that's a political question. That's a political claim and demand and a legitimate one. So I think it would, it would also involve us in a, in a much larger coalition of people with similar or aligned projects. I don't know if this answers your question, but it's not something we can imagine by ourselves, either as only poets or as only architects. One, I think one of the points I have sought to argue is that we need to uh, differentiate between civic space and public space. We tend to mm -hmm. equate the two. Uh, whereas, uh, I mean, public space is about spectacle and civic space is about engagement. And uh, I think that distinction is one that is not drawn in discussions on cities. And uh, so we wound up, uh, at, actually the history of urban planning as a profession comes from sanitation acts in the 18th century, you know, to cope with the crowding of the industrial revolution. And that history of uh, sanitation and purity has continued. So as Richard Sennett observes, urban planning has retreated into cocoons of scientific purity and lost its connection with broader humanistic concerns. Ranjit, I'll ask if any of the other attendees or participants sure. would like to ask you questions. We've got about, I think, another 10 minutes, if you don't mind. Sure, um, of course. If, uh, if uh, anyone would like to ask uh, uh, or uh, engage, please put on your videos and ask the question. Thank you. Uh, hi, Ranjit. I don't actually have a question, hi. but I have a little request. Can you okay. speak a little bit about uh, Laldev? Uh, I suppose you have translated uh, one of uh, few of her works. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that was a, it was a, it's a life. I mean, I hesitate to call it a project because it really was a, uh, yeah, it was a life journey. Where do I begin? Oh, it stems again. Um, I mean, I have other personal and biographical reasons for wanting to connect with Lala, but uh, how I would connect that to my talk of today would be, really again for the same reasons, that there are prior histories that show us how to be kaleidoscopic, how to live with different versions of who we can be. And we need to secure those for ourselves. We, we need to reclaim those histories because those histories will emancipate her. From the 14th century to about 1920, uh, some people called her Laleshwari, others called her Lala Rifa, yet others called her Lal Ded. <clears throat> there was no contradiction. There was a versionality. Um, we also know that uh, her poetry was not written by a single person. At the core of the Vox was a historical person. But these poems have been written by anonymous contributors over the centuries, over the generations, men and women, scribes and peasants, Hindus and Muslims, Sufis and Silsilas, uh, Pandit reciters. I, I think also, by the way, my theory from reading the original material is I think we can also see a fine line of possibly sick or sick influenced uh, contributors in the 19th century. So we are looking at a poet who's actually, whose work, if you put it together, if you, even if you take the 240 odd vox, however many vox you believe to be truly of value, it's a poetry that gives us a portrait of Kashmir. It gives us uh, a portraiture of a region. It speaks to histories of quest, suffering, violence over 700 years. And by the time I got to the end of my journey with the translation and with the contexts and everything, <clears throat> that is what really spoke to me. The fact that reading and translating poetry and writing poetry is also a political commitment. 
I don't know if this answers your question because there's, it would be a whole different lecture if I, if I spoke about this, but it was also a lesson in not being trapped in relatively recent and modern ways of dividing people. And uh, also one part of my introduction talks about how it's print modernity that really entrenches these divisions. It's when you need to have one authorized print version that all the versions come into contention. Then I don't have to repeat what, what we all know has happened, the tragedy, uh, the unfolding and continuing tragedy in Kashmir. It's, it's a situation that has made people take sides. And it's a situation that has made them take sides on what has gone before. And that to me is really a, a, a central part of this whole tragedy. Um, why would we divide ourselves not only in the present, but go back and divide even what we've inherited as a common heritage? That's, um, yeah, that's my thought. So another lecture where I can be, I would be happy to discuss the, the technical aspects of the translation and the research involved and so on. But for now, this is what I, this is what I would focus Thank on. You. I don't, does that answer your question? Well, it was not exactly a question, but yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Sanjit, it's been an absolutely marvelous evening. And uh, thank you for reminding us uh, that we must safeguard uh, the, many, the many versions of ourselves. Uh, and I think more than that, more than the safeguarding, that we must revel in it. I, I think it is a very, very important thing that you've shared with us today. Through both uh, Wajid Ali Shah his, uh, uh, yeah, and, and the city uh, and, the, and, the, and, and that wonderful building that, he, that uh, might be called a folly, but one will have to look at much more closely the next time one does. Thank you so much, uh, Ranjit. Uh, thank you. It's really been a pleasure. And thank you all for, for your for thank being you very here, much. for your responses. Thank you. Thank you. Re really and I think as far as Porsche is concerned, the first and the last lecture, they are of great significance to the group. Yeah. I mean, this is my view. In fact, uh, Rasavra Sar, I sometimes, today I feel that uh, Ranjit's lecture should have been much earlier. In no, the, I think this is really, I feel it is absolutely timely because it leaves us with so much of expectations yes. from ourselves, you know. Yes, but then we have only five days now. No, so. but you have, I think, why do you consider this as five days? I think it should go on. Of even course. when they are... <laughs> <laughs> but, but all the participants are keen to do something concrete. And but now, let them do. Their charade really begins now. One more, <laughs> one more thought, which pulls at many things that we have done wonderfully. And I, yeah. I'm very glad that it has happened. Yeah, so, of course. A little earlier might have been very nice too. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjit. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Bye bye. I'll take your contacts. Definitely. We'll build us for sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.